there. Nice to meet you or welcome back. You might know this or you might not, but this is my second attempt at a vampire-focused video. We're going to talk about the blood-sucking creatures of the night today, where they came from and where they went and how that happened at all. So, gather around the fire and I will tell you a tale. Here to assist me in my travels is Iznij, the vampire. Salutations, gentlefolk. Oh, no, we, we don't drink on the job. YouTube doesn't like that. Oh, don't worry, it's blood. Oh, no problem. Hey! Vampires are old. Very old. I don't mean that they live a long time, but their origins. Except they weren't called vampires way back then. The vampires we're generally familiar with these days are modeled after the likes of Dracula. Suave, handsome aristocrats who you'd willingly grant a bit of your blood. But the oldest of vampires weren't anything like that. In fact, most of them didn't quite look human at all. While it's difficult to pinpoint the very first time any legend ever spoke of a creature that sucked life force of some kind, be it blood or otherwise, we do know of several ancient examples that arose far before Dracula in lands far from Bram Stoker's Ireland home, all of which could be the first of their kind. One of those is the Edimu. If you've played The Witcher or watched my video on Witcher vampires exclusively, link in the description, you'll have heard of the Ekimara. The Edimu is the proto Ekimara, so to speak. They hail from Sumerian mythology, current day Iraq, and they were not aristocrats at all, but instead the ghosts of those buried without the proper rituals. Instead of drinking blood, they were said to become like the wind that sucked the life out of vulnerable targets, like those asleep, and at times, they would even possess their victims. There are plenty of other ancient stories about creatures and even gods that relish the taste of blood, like Sekhmet, an Egyptian goddess who had to be tricked into ending her literal bloodlust by feeding her beer disguised as blood. Or Kamazots, a Mayan vampire bat god whose name literally means death bat. Not strange, considering he liked to tear people's heads clean off. Funnily enough, there was an attempt at creating a true origin story for the vampire as we know it today in the form of the scriptures of Delphi. Delphi, in ancient Greece, best known for their oracle, of course, was said to have produced a set of scriptures at one point that also contained the origin story of the vampires. Wherever you read it, there will be small differences here and there. That should be our first hint. In every tale, the protagonist of our story is called Ambrogio, a regular Italian man. He goes to the temple in Delphi and is granted a cryptic prophecy after which he meets a woman named Celine, who he falls in love with. However, Apollo does not agree to their relationship and curses Ambrogio with a sunlight allergy. In order to still be with Celine, Ambrogio strikes a deal with Hades, either for protection in the underworld or immortal life. But Ambrogio's side of the deal was to steal the silver bow of Artemis. He attempts to do so but fails and is cursed with a silver allergy this time by Artemis. After explaining his situation to her, however, she takes pity and turns him into a super person by granting him the following rather extensive list of powers. Heightened senses, increased speed and strength, long fangs and claws, the power to heal himself and turn himself into a bat. Oh, and he has venomous saliva that turns others into vampires, although some stories leave out the healing and bat part. Eventually, Ambrosio either gets the deal with Hades settled or goes to be with Artemis forever, taking Selene with him in either story. Eventually, Selene starts to die, though, and to save her, Ambrosio turns her into a vampire, after which she turns into the moon. Fair trade, I should think. And then he goes on to make more small vampires. I wanted to mention this story because it is brought up on the World Wide Web quite often, and it is pretty obviously fake. Not just because, well, it's written like a terrible fanfic, but also because it represents the Greek mythology quite a bit. Don't even get me started on the fact that Ambrosio betrays Artemis, and in return she gives him practically every superpower under the sun to rival her own. But more to the point, this story incorporates practically every modern vampire trope, which would be a little bit weird for an ancient vampire retelling. And on top of that, there are no reputable sources for this work, so make of that what you will. Hey Artemis, what's up? Writing a fanfic. About what? Vampires. Vamp what? Vampires, they aren't invented yet. Sounds dumb. Later, loser. You're gonna be the bad guy. So, if that's not where modern day vampires started, where did it start? Well, they were imported initially, 
The word vampire wasn't widely used in the year 1734, not until a group of three English gentlemen decided to go on a trip. And when you went on a trip in those days, it was considered rather fashionable to write a travelogue. This being an account of someone's travels. This particular travelogue was aptly called Travels of Three English Gentlemen. In it, the gents describe their trip through Germany where, as it so happens, vampirism is being discussed. A Mr. Zopfius had taken it upon himself to start lecturing about the creatures and during one such speech he noted the following. The vampires, which come out of the graves in the night time, rush upon people sleeping in their beds, suck out all their blood and destroy them. Their countenances are fresh and ruddy and their nails, as well as hair, very much grown. And though they have been much longer dead than many other bodies, which are perfectly putrefied, not the least mark of corruption is visible upon them. Those who are destroyed by them, after their death, become vampires, so that, to prevent so spreading an evil, it is found requisite to drive a stake through the dead body, from whence, on this occasion, the blood flows as if the person was alive. This is the description of a vampire most of us would be familiar with, and this is the description the three English gentlemen brought back home. By this time, vampires had been a known creature in other countries for a while, but not in England. The majority of the legends seem to have spread from Slavic countries, where superstition was at an all-time high. That superstition was imported, alongside the name vampire. Back then, plagues were all the rage. The Great Plague of London hadn't been that long ago yet, and the Great Plague of Marseille was even fresher in everyone's mind. Both outbreaks of the bubonic plague. You know, the really bad one. And if you were but a little bit superstitious, you might decide that the true cause of all this pain was actually vampires. It's why the earliest vampires were not exactly suave aristocrats. They were described as bloated, bloody, purplish in color, long nails and hair. You know, a bit like a corpse, because that's what they were. And if you were in fact a plague victim, then you might have been unlucky enough to catch the septicemic plague version of the Black Death, which meant one of your symptoms included bleeding from your mouth. In those days, there weren't too many people around with knowledge on the precise effects of dying on any given body. Following a corpse's decay in various environments really wasn't anyone's main career choice. So, when a corpse wasn't calmly rotting the way one might expect, people started talking. And they started talking a little too much about Mercy Brown. Mercy Lena Brown was a young girl of only 19 when she was felled by the horrid disease that spread throughout the country at the time. Tuberculosis. She was not the first, however. Most of her family caught the thing before she did. First her mother, then her sister, her brother, and finally, Mercy caught it too, and died soon after. The father of the family was now the only one left alongside the brother who, while still ill, was fighting as best he could. And as he was the only healthy one left, the town began to suspect that perhaps there was devilry afoot. They told the father that perhaps one of the Brown family's women wasn't dead. Perhaps there was a vampire. And so they set about digging up the bodies of the deceased to check for fresh blood in their hearts. After nearly a decade had passed, of course, Mercy's mother and sister had been reduced to nothing but bones. However, Lena had died quite recently, and the winter had ensured that her grave was practically a freezer. She looked remarkably fresh. That sealed the deal for the town, and they cut out her heart and liver, burning it to ashes and feeding said ashes to her brother in hopes of curing him. He died less than two months on. Mercy's story, you might be surprised to hear, took place in 1892, not long before Dracula was written. In a lot of places at that point, people still put stock in vampire tales, especially in the more rural areas, where a lot of the medical knowledge just hadn't reached yet. It wasn't until much later, when the general populace became more aware of how corpses worked, that the vampire craze well and truly ended. So we'll take this corpse as an example. Here, vampire! Her hair wasn't that long when she died, and her nails were cut. Yeah, see, that doesn't actually mean anything, because when a person dies, their skin retracts. So that means the hair seems like it's grown, and the nails seem like they've grown, but really, it's just the entire body shriveling up. Oh yeah? What about the teeth then? Long fangs right there. Same thing, the gums lose fluid over time and the gums retract, making it seem like they're really long fangs. Yeah, well I buried this one a month ago and it still looks completely fresh. Yes, you buried it in frozen ground. That's typically how you preserve a corpse. Well, 
Actually, she looks well fed and there's blood coming from her nose. Corpse gas. Decomposition actually makes your entire body blow up like a hot air balloon and the pressure makes blood ooze from your mouth and your nose. What? Corpse gas. What? Corpse gas. Hey. But before even Mercy's story or a Dracula, vampires had already been written into literature. Lord Byron wrote a poem about a vampire once called the Giaour. Unquenched, unquenchable, around within thy heart shall dwell, nor ear can hear nor tongue can tell the tortures of that inward hell. But first on earth as vampire sent, thy corpse shall from its tomb be rent, then ghastly haunt thy native place, and suck the blood of all thy race. Lord Byron was quite a character in his time, one of the most important artists of the Romantic movement, in fact. And so important was his name that when John William Polidori wrote the short story The Vampire in 1819, the magazine it was published in falsely attributed it to Lord Byron to drum up more readership. As a side note, Polidori actually wrote The Vampire after a meeting with several rather well-known writers, amongst which Lord Byron and Marie Shelley, where the group told each other horror stories and after the fact they wrote some new work of their own. Lord Byron wrote the unfinished story, A Fragment, upon which the vampire was based, and Marie Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Regardless, partly because of the little Lord Byron trick and partly because it was just a good story, the vampire became quite popular and, in fact, it was the first vampire story where the creature was transformed from a faceless monster into a suave aristocrat. After this publication, vampire stories, operas and plays started popping up all over the place, such as Carmilla in 1872, a story about a female vampire named Carmilla who moves from female victim to female victim, this time following Laura, the protagonist. We later find out that Carmilla is in fact also Myrcella, Countess Karnstein, and yes, Carmilla is an anagram of Myrcella. She also uses a different anagram for a different victim at some point, Milarka. Yeah, and you thought Alucard was being unoriginal. Anyway, yes, there is definitely a romantic undertone in this particular story, which is something we see a lot of nowadays, too, in new vampire tales. Boy, those two really get along well, don't they? Oh, Carmilla and Laura? Yeah, they're two mates. Two mates. Two mates. Oh my god, they are two mates! And, well, after that we got Dracula. We all know Dracula by now, I believe. You know, the book we've all heard of but never read. Unless you're writing a video about vampires. Weirdly, the book Dracula doesn't actually have a great deal of Dracula in it. Most of the book talks about everyone surrounding Dracula. The opening chapters deal with one of the protagonist's visits to Dracula's castle and their meeting, but after that, minimum amounts of Dracula. We deal with the ladies getting bitten and the men trying to find the cause of their acute blood loss. The book is more of a mystery novel than anything else. Rather interesting, honestly. Too bad it keeps getting interrupted by phrases from the men writing female characters in books school of writing, such as My dear Mina, why are men so noble and we women are so little worthy of them? But there are also gems like Ah, that wonderful Madame Mina. She has a man's brain. A brain that a man should have were he much gifted and a woman's heart. And who can forget the classic how can women help loving men when they are so earnest and so true and so brave? And two, it made me think of the wonderful power of money. Yes, this book is certainly something. And don't even get me started on the German phrases thrown out by Van Helsing, the Dutch doctor, left, right and center. Yeah. 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 No, Dracula hasn't aged gracefully, but that doesn't matter, because at the time it was fresh and well-loved. I'd wager that's largely because Dracula isn't just a vampire story, it's a detective too. We might all know Dracula now, but back then, one would pick up this book without knowing that Dracula is in fact a vampire. Imagine that. But another reason I believe Dracula did so well was tuberculosis, or TB. Strange sentence, okay, let me rephrase that. We were nearing the end of the 19th century when Dracula was published, and in the 19th century, one of the most prolific diseases was tuberculosis. TB had been around for a very long time, but it was during the 19th century that it became a romanticized disease, literally. It was seen as a romantic disease, 
So much so that this particular sickness began to represent spiritual purity and temporal wealth. Young upper-class women tended to purposefully pale their skin to get that proper TB look going. Lord Byron, the guy falsely credited with the story The Vampire, even said the following on the topic. How pale I look! I should like, I think, to die of consumption. Because then the women would all say, See that poor Byron! How interesting he looks in dying! Of course, only when the upper-class youth caught it was it considered as such. When the poor people got it, it was still considered really gross. A vaccine for TB wasn't used on humans until 1921, nine years after Bram Stoker's death, and even then it wasn't widespread. I'm sure the comment on pale ladies already gave it away somewhat. Many of the symptoms related to TB were also vampire symptoms, apparently. Coughing up blood, tiredness, weight loss, lack of appetite, pale skin and so on. Like I said, the majority of the book doesn't really deal with a vampire and his quest to bite as many people as he can, like in Salem's Lot. No, the book seems to describe a vampire almost as a disease. When Lucy is first bitten, her condition continues to decline, much in the same way as TB would. By giving his version of vampirism these particular traits, Stoker made sure that the readers at the time could see the vampire appear in their own town in the form of a very real illness. And from Dracula onwards, the gentleman vampire stuck around. A symbol of the aristocratic upper crust literally leeching off the poor. Even when Stoker himself had absolutely no intention of criticizing the rich, of which he and his friends were a part. Now we have stories like Twilight, True Blood, Vampire Diaries and so on and so forth, where beautiful men with moderately sharp teeth, amazing strength and speed and the knowledge of a thousand years compete for the affections of a high school age to early twenties girl. But also monsters with a heart of gold like The Witcher, Darren Shan or Daybreakers, the kind that, while a vampire, find it something of a burden. We have vast societies based on vampirism alone in Vampire the Masquerade, Warhammer and Underworld, where the greatest good is the good of the group, but also funny vampires in Hotel Transylvania or What We Do in the Shadows. The things we know about vampires are pretty streamlined these days. They're weak to sunlight and holy water and crosses and getting staked through the heart. They're all incredibly handsome and long-lived. The majority of these tropes are pretty easy to track. Sunlight, crosses, stakes, they all appeared in Dracula, of course. So that makes vampire stories a little bit too easy to predict. Writers everywhere sought to fix that problem. Eat garlic, you fiend! Oh, huh. I, I said eat garlic! Oh, I'd be delighted to. What? Uh, don't mind me. I'm subverting your expectations. Most people by now know about a vampire's most common attributes. That was a problem. While folklore was the basis for the majority of these ideas, they didn't quite hold up in modern times. In the 19th century, England was a Christian country. Ideas like the cross and holy water defeating evil were easy enough to sell. After all, vampires are of the devil. These days, a quick Google search tells me that roughly 31% of the world is Christian. Presenting crosses as the ultimate weapon to defeat evil is a lot harder to sell to a younger demographic especially. And the younger demographic is arguably the main target for new writers. So modern day vampires had to be updated in terms of how they operate. Not just for the sake of modernity, but also to differentiate themselves from other vampire shows. How do they let us know that they're not like the other vampires? A lot of series, for example, change the sunlight idea. In Blade, the main character is a half-vampire, so he can walk outdoors during the day. The less pure-blooded vampires can even go out as long as they wear enough sunscreen. In Twilight, well... This is what I am. Crosses also don't return as a weakness in most newer shows, nor does Holy Water. Shows will make up new vampire problems instead. For example, silver is brought up a lot. Yes, silver. You might already know that silver is generally the werewolf's main weakness, but now the vampires have joined them in their trouble. In case you were wondering, no, Dracula really wasn't weak to silver in any way. In fact, when Jonathan Harker makes it to Dracula's castle in the book, he is greeted by the Count himself, who is holding an antique silver lamp. The silver idea might have come from the fact that Van Helsing uses a silver crucifix. The crucifix being the dangerous part, of course, not the silver. But the anti-vampire tropes are not the only things that changed. 
Vampires moved from their ancient castle and into an expensive penthouse in the middle of a bustling city. Or they live in a secluded mansion in the woods, while their younger-looking members join the local high school. Or they team up in large, not-so-ancient but still very expensive castles to form their own coven, with blood donors and fancy weaponry to defend themselves from the impending werewolf war. The vampire has evolved to be whatever we want them to be, and in a lot of cases they've taken on the werewolf as an adversary, which is a little bit strange because in a lot of old stories, werewolves and vampires were the same thing. It was believed that if a person was a werewolf after their death, they would become a vampire, which makes it even stranger that they are adversaries now. So where did that trope come from? In 1941, Universal Pictures released a film called The Wolfman, a werewolf film that became far more popular than its predecessor, Werewolf of London, and subsequently it became part of a sort of monster cinematic universe called Universal Classic Monsters, alongside the Phantom of the Opera, Dracula, Frankenstein, the Mummy, the Invisible Man, and the Creature from the Black Lagoon. The studio eventually started work on a script called Wolfman vs. Dracula, but it was never actually filmed. The seed, however, was planted. Jacinto Molina Alvarez, also known as Paul Nashi, became a big fan of horror cinema, and especially the Wolfman, eventually creating his own werewolf character, Waldemar Daninsky. A lot of the movies he wrote, starring his very own Wolfman, would see him fight vampires, just like the abandoned Dracula movie. But the films never really broke through in America, until a man called Samuel M. Sherman got into trouble over a Frankenstein movie. Sherman was asked to provide some 400 movie theaters with a Frankenstein movie, and for that purpose he created Dracula vs. Frankenstein. Unfortunately for Sherman, the film lab he chose to develop his movie refused to give it back. Not wanting to break his contract, he went to Nashi and bought one of his werewolf vs. vampire movies. To fix the small inaccuracy that is the lack of Frankenstein in this movie, he pretended that the Frankenstein clan had changed into Wolfstein during the intro slides and named the movie Frankenstein's Bloody Terror. And so, accidentally, a werewolf versus vampire movie was launched in America to great success and a new trope was born, especially since Nashi would not stop making these movies. Why does it work? Well, I suppose in media it's just taken on the two sides factor. You know, like pirates and ninjas and cats and dogs. There's always two sides of one coin. Which side do you choose? Except, you know, the vampires are cats and cats are vampires. They have the, uh, the cool monster quality, as it were. But with that, we are at the end of our vampire video. So, Isnish, any parting words? Hmm, ah, oh, well, let's see. Uh, Dracula's backstory was actually not based on uh, Vlad the Impaler. Stoker just stole the name. Everything else about Dracula's backstory doesn't actually work with Vlad at all. In fact, his original script was called The Undead, not Dracula. And the high-collared cape you see Dracula wearing so often is actually a stage invention. It made it easier for the Dracula actor to vanish on stage. Oh, and yes, vampires probably do represent some kind of sexual frustration, but I think we all know that by now. Watch the Castlevania show and also Buffy. Second it. Buffy. I've honestly not been a vampire for that long, so I, I don't really have a long list of victims yet, unfortunately. But, you know, I'm proud of every single one of them, which is why I keep their names, and sometimes I check in on them to see how they're doing. So, for example, Wall Guy the Robin? Yeah, he seems to have taken to feeding on birds, but I don't know that that's going to sustain him in the long run, if I'm perfectly honest. I mean, birds are pretty small. Wall Guy is a pretty big guy, you know, being human, or at least ex-human at this point, at least. Um. People have started disappearing near the woods, so, I mean, I don't want to draw any conclusions, but I think I might be drawing some conclusions here. I picked up Robertson S.O. near a guest house at some place. I don't know what he was doing there, but, you know, it was an easy target because he was alone. Um, he said he didn't really mind, though. He was kind of getting bored of the party he was at, so I think I did him a favor. I feel like I'm doing most people a favor when I turn them into a vampire at this point. And, you know, he went off and slaughtered the guests immediately, so I don't think he really had a strong connection to any of them. Yeah, so fun fact. Loch Muin I picked up as a dragon. Yeah, I don't know how they got to this particular part of the world, but yeah, I mean, if Magic the Gathering can do it, why can't I? I wanted to see what a vampire dragon looked like, so picked up Loch Muin. Now I've got a vampire dragon. Although, it's not like he really listens to me. Um, several entire villages have disappeared um, in the near vicinity, so I feel a little bit bad about that one. But, but, 
I got to see a vampire dragon, so I really can't complain. MGS cool stuff was a little bit trickier. I think this one might have wanted to try and kill me. I think that might have been why they were there. Uh, I, I can't really ask anymore, obviously, because they just started screaming at me after the fact and then went to turn their wife as well. And I think they're just doing the reign of terror thing together now. So I'm really at this point not sure if they were there to kill me or if they were trying to bait a bite. <laughs> Get it? Bait a bite? Ha! <laughs> yeah, anyway, people are giving them nicknames like um, the sister murderers and all that now. So um, now they did, they did try to explain that they were married, but nobody wants to listen. Probably because they're too busy screaming, really. Septic came to me. I mean, really just came to me. I don't know that they knew I was a vampire. Um, they knocked on my door and asked about cats. Uh, not really familiar. I tried to show him my long-haired cat, obviously. Um, tried to tell him about the large naked cat that was Nosferatu from Dracula, but I don't think either of them were of his interest and I got a little bit bothered, so I just made him a vampire instead and told him to go figure it out on his own. And then he flew off yelling about cats, still. Yeah, strange man. Mike Sveers was probably the first one who almost killed me. I, I, maybe accidentally, I, I'm not sure. They were kind of surrounded by garlic, but uh, personally, I'm a fan of garlic, uh, little known fact. Vampires love garlic, it's so tasty. Like, I'm part Italian, how am I not gonna like garlic? I'd be disowned, couldn't have that. Anyway, yeah, I think he was prepared and uh, there were several stakes fired. Yeah, several stakes fired. Um, when he turned into a vampire though, I think at first he thought it was kind of neat, but he did try to stake himself, so might still be in a small phase of denial. He did clean up all of his garlic, said it tasted great, can confirm. We're going out for dinner later this week, uh, gonna show him the world, you know, a lot in like but better. Adrian Peckel, I actually found dead. Yeah, I know, I know, not the noblest of victims, but uh... Look, girls gotta eat, all right? So it was fresh, so technically that counted. Plus he came back as a vampire and he thanked me. So, you know, you're welcome. The second life, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't really see coming that he would then immediately start murdering all the people that wronged him in life. Um, starting with the guy who murdered him. Yeah, murder victim, right? Who would have known? Well, I certainly wouldn't, but you know, I had food, he had food. We're all happy. Ray Ray is my newest addition and I actually found him at a, a park. Yeah, one of those lake sort review things. Frickly nice place. Too much sun though, I'm not gonna lie. I could do with a little less sun. Um, he honestly thought the same thing, but, but, bright sides to everything, let's not mention the sun anymore, but bright sides to everything is there's so many tourists there and nobody's gonna miss him. He can eat an entire family and no one will know. They'll all think he drowned or something, which is great because lots of people drown there. I mean, it's not great that lots of people drown there, but uh, easy pickings. Am I right? Am I right? I should have stuck around. I might go back sometimes. Yeah, yeah, good victim that one. 